Good afternoon, everybody. We have three speakers this afternoon uh, covering three very important topics. Uh, I'm sure that uh, uh, you would uh, enjoy. I've, I've gone through their qualification and certainly uh, will be very, very proud to have such distinguished uh, speakers. Thank you. Um, this is a great honor to be here to share my passion for cities. Uh, both Shanghai and Mumbai are fascinating places with a very rich history and a unique physical context, and both have the opportunity to become major players uh, like in the world scene. Both cities are transforming themselves at a very fast pace and are setting the direction for urban development in their respective country. So the current global financial crisis has permanently shifted the world economic power to emerging markets like India and China. As uh, global CEOs uh, said at the five-day World Economic Forum, like in Davos uh, this week. So what does this new paradigm mean, like global presence, means for cities like Mumbai and Shanghai? Uh, so, and how do cities like Mumbai and Shanghai transform themselves into world-class cities? What are the criteria that governs this process? And what is the model that one chooses for each one of these cities? Uh, obviously, both cities have very different contexts. Uh, the governance system is being the most obvious. Uh, on a global scale, it is critical that the transformation address uh, some of the biggest challenges that we're facing the, like this century, uh, with population growth uh, being a major issue, especially like in Asia, you know, like I see, is our you know, stretch of limit. And, combined, and that combined with climate change is an enormous challenge, but also it provides an opportunity to really give us like an ability to rethink how we plan our cities and how we transform them. So, so most of my talk today will not be about new cities, which we've done a lot of projects also, but it's to talk about how we deal with the existing cities, which is a major issue that we have to deal with. Um, um, so again, like, like cities are the pillars of our civilization. Over half of the world population currently like lives in cities. Both Mumbai and Shanghai are mega cities today uh, that need to be like resilient, uh, sustainable and vital and stable. Uh, and by 2050, uh, it is estimated that over 75% of the world population will live in cities. So how is Shanghai uh, dealing with that growth? And so, like again, like the model of Shanghai is not necessarily applicable to Mumbai, but there's some lessons learned that one can, you know, can, can use. So Shanghai is a unique city like in Asia. The city is already a player in the global marketplace and is solidly re-emerging as a leading global city for Asia. So to better understand where Shanghai is heading, I think it's important to understand and very uh, uh, like captivating to understand what role Shanghai played historically in Shanghai, um, like in China. Uh, Shanghai's unique urban fabric is the result of a very fascinating history. Uh, in the 20s and 30s, Shanghai was East Asia's most important trade and financial center. The city was home to major financial institutions most were aligned along the Bund, which is the famous waterfront uh, boulevard like along the Wangpu River. And the Western uh, concessions, uh, like in Shanghai, created a multicultural climate that was unique for Asia. Shanghai was probably, in fact, the first global city in Asia at that time. And adding to the economic uh, prosperity of the city, Shanghai was also the host of a flurry of East meets West cultural exchange in the arts, architecture, and commerce. Shanghai was an international city then, and the doorway to China for the, for the Western world. The city was often called the Paris of the East. The war and revolution obviously stopped that growth. Uh, the post-war emphasis in China on internal development through the 1980s has really stunned uh, Shanghai's position as a global business and trading center. And that resulted in other cities in Asia basically taking that role. So Hong Kong quickly assumed the role, that role for Asia, and as a consequence, experienced a massive growth. Like Singapore and Tokyo, Hong Kong invested in public infrastructure, mass transit, affordable housing, and civic amenities, and also established a supportive climate for business, uh, becoming not just the main business and trading center for East Asia, but a global city uh, at the same time. 
Singapore and Tokyo embark on similar program and emerge as global center on their own term. So I mentioned the term global city. So let's, let's, let's discuss what really defines a global city and how do we you know, um, uh, judge what makes like a successful like, like global city. So there's civil metric system that have been developed you know, by various organizations in, like either in the US or in the UK or even like in Japan uh, that rank cities worldwide as they compete to attract businesses, like international businesses, like in the marketplace. And so, like shown here are some of these um, like ranking kind of like system that have been developed to date. So, how does Shanghai, which has been modernizing for the last 20 years, compare with other global financial centers today? So, London, for instance, that is top rank in most systems, benefits from the density of its main financial district, the scale, diversity, and, afford and affordability of its public transit system and the quality and extent of its cultural facilities. Shanghai lags behind London, New York, and Tokyo in its cultural offering currently, and Shanghai's business and financial centers are not dense enough yet and do not have in place yet the public transit that, that people in Hong Kong and Tokyo, for, for instance, take for granted. Uh, and in terms of we as architects and urban planners, we have the ability to really play a role in three aspects uh, of what are the five you know, tenets like of the ranking kind of system, which is how do we create a place that really attracts smart people? Because in a way, uh, you know, business wants to locate like in a city where like, there's a pool of very smart people. So smart people tend to want to live in great places. So, so that's part of the idea. And then the infrastructure aspect, you know, like transportation, buildings, and so on. And the general quality of life like in a city is a critical aspect that we have to take into account. So, so then... So that what we did, you know, when we, because we've been doing a lot of work in Shanghai for quite a while now, and I've done a range of projects, and so we've been playing a role to, you know, to help shape, you know, like some of that transformation, and so so we've often bring some of the lessons learned from other cities, you know, but that we bring like to the work we do like in like Shanghai. So so what are the lessons learned, for, like for instance, from London, Tokyo, and Hong Kong, that can help steer the urban transformation like of Shanghai in a direction that will enhance its global appeal. So London, for instance, it's, you know, like it's a unique city, and a bit like New York, actually, has two major bi like business centers. Like, like the CBD, which is the city of London, has historically been its financial district, and, and Curry Wharf, the new district, uh, also along the Thames River, was developed to accommodate new financial institutions. Both business districts create a unique setting and develop a synergy that makes London a very attractive business environment and the top city in most ranking system. Both Canary Wharf and the City of London are vital mixed-use districts that promote an active urban lifestyle. Both districts are pedestrian-friendly and very well served by public transit. The public transportation system, like in London, is one of the most efficient and extensive systems in the world. Other strategies that a city has also embarked as it relates to transportation includes building new subway lines, even though it's in, you know, you know like, like in the core of the city itself, promote cycling as a viable mode of transportation and, and put in place all the measures that really like enforce this. And, and, and even uh, um, uh, look at measures to limit the use of private cars in the center city through various measures, uh, including an attempt at, to implement a, a pilot a congestion uh, program within the center city, which is another uh, idea also that was discussed like in New York City. So, uh, and on the amenity front, London has an amazing array of cultural institutions and landmarks, which includes museums, parks, that all contributes to the city's worldwide appeal. So, in other words, it's a great place to live and work. So, Hong Kong. So, as I mentioned before, Hong Kong grew from the decline of Shanghai after the war and the revolution. The city is especially dense as it is very constrained landmines, uh, land wise and the, favor the favorable business environment uh, has been a major factor in attracting many of the international businesses that have located there. Just like London did, Hong Kong Business District is now expanding north into Kowloon, uh, like in a very bold way. And in this case, the concept is to also include new cultural institutions to enrich the civic life of the citizen. The city is very well served by public transportation, including f subway, ferries, trains to the mainland, buses, and so on. 
and this promotes a pedestrian-oriented city center. The Kowloon Cultural District will feature a new modern art museum, numerous theaters, concert halls, other performance venues under the management of the West Kowloon Cultural District Authority, which is directly financed by the government. Cultural, uh, culture is definitely, definitively seen as a tool to improve the overall quality of life of the residents, thus making the city more competitive on the global marketplace to attract talent, a key element for global business. In contrast to Hong Kong, and quite similar to Shanghai, Tokyo is unconstrained by its landmass. Uh, Fumi Ikomaki, who is a uh, local architect, described Tokyo as nibbler or multi-centered. It is the prototypical polycentric city, like a city that has you know, like a range of cores. Uh, yes, the various words like the city are connected by subway and express train system, more closely knit than any other comparable system in the world. Rail is the primary mode of transportation in Tokyo, which has the most extensive urban railway network in the world and an equally extensive network of surface lines. Each word has its own municipal government of its own and basically has at its core services, jobs and institutions to function as an entity. The Tokyo Central Business District is vital and with the addition in the last decade of the mixed-use Roppongi Hills and Midtown development has become a major destination in the city. So some of the lessons that we learned is that global cities uh, are sustainable and they have the ability to evolve and remain vital over time. Clearly uh, is that they promote a mixed-use environment, they are pedestrian friendly, they are transit oriented, they provide a high quality of life, they provide a wide range of options for housing and jobs, and are stable from a political and economic perspective. So, uh, so now, where is like Shanghai, you know, in that regard? So, you know, because like Shanghai is going through this incredible transformation, and Shanghai is committed to move into the top tier of global, uh, you know, like world cities. Um, as it's witnessed by its high level of public investment in, moder in modernization. The city is pursuing different path to this goal. One is focused on Pudong, which is Shanghai's new international business center, and the other is focused on the older Pushi district, a mix of commercial streets and dense residential neighborhoods that predates World War II. Development in these districts is a good indication as to where the city is headed. In addition, the city is hosting the Shanghai 2010 Expo this year, which main focus is how to create a more eco-friendly society that promotes sustainable development, improve water quality, which is a major issue in China, and encourage historic preservation of unique districts and historic cities. In the last 10 years, private cars ownership uh, for the emerging middle class in Shanghai has drastically increased, which led to traffic congestion and pollution problems that, if left unchecked, will make it harder for the city to achieve the walkable urbanity that contributes to the sustainability and livability of the higher-ranking global financial centers. Some of the challenges and opportunities that a city as a whole is facing is how to create a responsible model of development that can evolve over time. The city has embarked on a major program of mass transit that is not dissimilar to Tokyo. The creation of vital mixed-use districts linked by public transit is critical as a way to address the current Shanghai sprawl. When the Shanghai urban transformation began in earnest following the economic reform of 1989, new urban scale development was concentrated in Pudong. Uh, uh, it's on former farmland across the Wangpu River from Pushi. This strategy of focusing that growth into that area was actually similar to what London did with Canary Wharf, really. It, like, it allowed new construction to occur at a very fast pace and scale without impacting the existing urban fabric. Pudong has become a new economic development zone and has emerged as China financial and commercial hub. Pudong's skyline includes the Oriental Pearl Tower, the Jin Mao Building, the recently completed Shanghai World Financial Center, and currently under construction and to be completed by 2014, the Gensler designed uh, Shanghai Tower, reflective of Shanghai, uh, of Shanghai and China's rapid economic development. With the completion of the Shanghai Tower in 2014, the Pudong Financial District 
will be anchored by a transit serve super high rise precinct that signals a new emphasis on walkable urbanism for that district. The Shanghai Tower rise from a, from a pavilion that is open and accessible rather than walled off from its surroundings and which face and extends the district's largest park. Although it is linked to adjacent towers and the metro station via below grade connections, the intent of the urban design is to encourage walking at grade level. The tower is designed to meet aggressive sustainability goals and is targeted to be a model for sustainable high-rise development in the city and the country as a whole. Shanghai Tower borrows from, from the strategy of the city's older residential neighborhoods in a way that organized neighborhoods around communal, communal open spaces. The mixed-use structure rises in 15-story increments, each of these separated by a sky garden. Filled with amenities, this atrium space, sorry, uh, this atrium space uh, functions uh, to provide occupants with a naturally ventilated thermal buffer. And along the Wangpu River, uh, uh, across Pudong, uh, Pushi is the historical center city, similar to the old city of London or to or to Lower Manhattan, or to South Mumbai here. That includes, um, uh, and so Pushi includes the old city district and the original Western concessions. It is home also to the major commercial streets, like in Shanghai, which is uh, Nanjing Road and Waha Road, and also the Bond, which is the historical financial street along the river that defined the Shanghai skyline for a century. In that respect, Shanghai and London share the similarity to have two financial districts. Pushi is similar to the center city of London in that it has a rich history, fantastic historic buildings, is pedestrian friendly, is, is served by transit, provides a mix of uses and density that makes the area very unique and attractive as a place to work, live and play. A former French... Uh, uh, um, uh, Lac Chintiani, which was uh, mentioned like right before, uh, is a former French uh, uh, is in the former La French La Concession, and so and Pushy uh, uh, um, uh, Lac Lac also includes one of the most successful projects that has occurred like, in the last few years like, in Shanghai, Lac Chintiani, which was developed by a Shu Online uh, company. Uh, they they were able to assemble a very large site and work with munis with the municipal authorities to arrive at an overall master plan. What makes Shintiani stand out is the degree to which historic preservation, community serving open spaces, and an array of uses and activities, including shops, cafes, bars, restaurants, housing, and, open, and office space, were integrated. And the result is a destination that has proven popular with city residents and visitors. Shintiani was a breakthrough project for Shanghai because it proved the value of preserving the past as an element in the evolving cityscape, while the commercial value of that strategy is what attracted the notice of other developers, the greater value of Shintiandi may lie in what it suggests for the city's future, a greater urbanity that to help Shanghai rise its profile as a global financial center. Um, so we've been involved like, in a large project, also like, in the Pushy side, which is one of the projects we've been involved, uh, which I will uh, describe kind of briefly, which is you know, oops, which is kind of a new direction that we think Lake Shanghai is embarking. Uh, and, so, and so the developer, Lake Shanghai Creed Real Estate, has sponsored a new plan for a district of Pushi prepared by Gensler and Tongji University, aimed at reviving its role as a downtown business and commercial center. Uh, the plan suggests a new model for how uh, to redevelop Shanghai's historic central core at an urban scale while preserving its character and reinforcing its, its sustainability. The site is centrally located between the old city, a major tourist destination, and already established district. The Pushi district embraces the bond on the eastern edge. The district needs to clearly provide strong connection between these disparate districts and reinforce the role that Pushi plays as a mixed-use commercial district. The redevelopment of the district provides an opportunity to promote selective preservation of historic architecture and neighborhood while creating a vital 
and viable, sustainable modern urban district in Shanghai. The plan strives to reconnect in a very careful manner the, this older district with the city. One of the first tasks that the team did was to document the area very carefully uh, to evaluate which buildings and urban elements of the district should be preserved for rehabilitation. The master plan proposed critical pedestrian linkages throughout the planning area to create stronger linkages between major open spaces, urban places, retail street, and the waterfront, as well as to enhance the livability and viability of the historic commercial Jingling Road, which is one of the uh, uh, original roads from the French Lacan section, which is now like in disarray, but could be a fantastic like, destination. Um, and the idea was to link it then like, with the successful Waha Road uh, and, and use like, this creation of a new like, historic district but that people kind of walk through and then go up to the Jingling Road and then have this experience up to the waterfront. And the goal, obviously, is to create a pedestrian-friendly district. So like all these efforts that we're doing by reinforcing retail, uh, you know, and by playing like with the scale and so on, is to really create a place that people will walk. And so, and so the plan, uh, and so the master plan focuses uh, mixed-use density development around the existing and planned transit public nodes and makes a great effort to preserve large section of this unique historic district for mixed-use cultural and retail uses. Careful urban infill and historic preservation combined with a stated goal of creating a sustainable transit-oriented district provides the basis for the plan. The Pushi Master Plan subdivided the area into four distinct sub-districts that complement each other and add to the vitality of the area as a whole. The four sub-districts were the financial, like a new financial district, the, the mixed-use retail historic sub-district, which was like a way to link the, the retail activities like from Waha Road, which is a very vital like retail street, and link it like with the Jingling Road, where, which is the le, like historic uh, street like in that part of town. And then there's a North Gateway mixed-use sub-district, which includes office uh, and housing. Uh, and a new cultural sub-district, uh, uh, like on the waterfront along the bond, that will provide a strong linkage with the old city uh, and the waterfront as well. Um, so the financial center sub-district includes modern office building, hotel, and a museum devoted to the city of Shanghai that also works as a gateway to the old city. The, the sub-district is centered on a central open space and various urban plazas that will link the new and existing buildings. The mixed-use retail historic sub-district uh, will provide the transition and linkage uh, between the two major kind of commercial streets. Uh, and, and, uh, and the Pushi plant uh, treats the frontage along the Wangpu River with medium-scale development and introduce a range of cultural facilities, smaller uh, uh, locally focused museums, art galleries, the performance space, uh, as well as a site for a potential major new international museum. Uh, and as we learned from New York, London, and now Hong Kong, uh, cultural users have proven to be a major agent of urban transformation, so a spillover effect can be expected. So, oops, sorry. So as London and New York have shown, there are benefits for a top-tier global financial center to have a midtown as well as a downtown. So, uh, so Shanghai was a global city in the 20s and 30s, and the Pushy Plan uh, suggests a path the city could take for the next 20 years to go again. So, man, so, man, so Mumbai has embarked on a massive transformation and needs to develop its own urban model that needs to be based on sound, sustainable development principles. Developing greater urbanity and reinforcing social equity are closely related. As Fumiko Maki again observed, the city remains stable as long as balance is maintained among the different territories of the city and friction at the boundaries are minimal. This is without any doubt one of the biggest challenge of the emerging global cities in India and in China. And as a concluding uh, remarks from the Prime Minister, uh, Dr. Singh, uh, uh, if Mumbai fails, then India fails. So obviously it's not an option. So thank you. <laughs>